Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've joined us. As you may know, we're studying the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series of lessons is entitled Revival and Reformation. It's a series for the months of July, August, and September of 2013. This is the final lesson in that series. It's the lesson for September 28, and it's entitled The Promised Revival. God's mission completed, and it's really a discussion about the latter rain and what all that implies and how it comes and what keeps it from coming, and we're going to have fun talking about it. So I hope you have your Bible handy and that you've got your thinking cap on, and let's begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, it's a great privilege to have your guidance, your protection, your care for us every day. And Lord, we wish that we did a better job of following your guidance and following your direction. The latter rain, I'm sure you, you feel like you're just on hold for years and years while you're waiting for us to get ready. Help us to see our way through the maze of human complications and problems that we have here to be a part of that group that will stand firm through those final events of this earth's history. We want to be more like you. Help us to find the way is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you are interested in the materials that we prepare for this discussion, um, we prepare a handout that's available on our website at www.theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. It's a nonprofit place. And uh, it, it provides some extra thinking for things you might want to talk about in your Sabbath school class. And the video and audio is and also available. Video and audio is also available. And excellent materials to help prepare if you're a teacher. Yes, yes, class. okay. <laughs> the latter rain <laughs> will place the finishing touches of God's remnant on God's remnant people to give them the power and the ability, even the authority, to reach the world with the Seventh-day Adventist message, which is really not the Seventh-day Adventist message, it really, it's God's message. So what needs, to, what, what stands between us where we are today, and I, I, maybe I shouldn't point to you, what, <laughs> what stands between us where we are here and to become like we're all jolly, jolly here so we're ready to enter the kingdom, huh? What, what, what's preventing it? First, where did the metaphor rain come from? Well, I was going to talk about that a little bit later, but let's talk about that now. There's a couple things. You know, I used to be really confused about this. The early rain and the latter rain and the early rain, someone said it comes in the fall and the latter rain comes in the spring, and that seemed completely backwards to me. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, in the Jewish calendar, it begins, the Jewish calendar begins in September. And the early rains come in October and November which is the early rain in their calendar year. And the latter rains come in April, May, into June, maybe. And that's not at the end of their calendar, but it's clo much closer to the end of the calendar. So in their year, that was the early rain and the latter rain in the year. What, what about their agricultural year? And we're going to talk about that. Let me talk about that. Of course, they, they live not too far from the tropics, so they didn't get really cold weather in the, in, in during, the, during the winter months. But So they would plant a crop, particularly their, their grain crops, they would plant with the early rains in, say, October, and those crops would grow over the winter, what we, might, what we in this country might call winter wheat, and they would grow over the winter with a little bit of rain, whether it be less rain, but there would be enough to keep the plants gradually growing. And then they, the plants really mature with, with the latter rain that comes April, May, and they harvest then in June. So the early rain's there to get things going, and the latter rain's there to finalize things. So that's, that's the way that worked. Um, so I'm going to come back to a sobering thought. God started out with Adam. He had to start over with Noah. He basically had to start over again with Abraham. He had to start over again with the Christian church. Then he apparently was trying to sort of partially start over again with the Protestant Reformation. And we sometimes think he made his final effort when he 
organized this, or helped get started the Seventh-day Adventist Church. But now, with all those failures, if you will, preceding us, what kind of arrogance do we have to think that somehow or other we're going to succeed when all those others have failed? Well, yeah, I'm listening. Isn't that kind of cheating? What? Well, <clears throat> Satan says, the great controversy, that God's laws for the universe don't work. Mm -hmm. And so now he starts down here with Adam, and sure enough, that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And then we got to clean the whole slate off with no one starts all over, and, and pretty soon that doesn't work. So now he's got to start all over with uh, Abraham. And so isn't it just being proven over and over and over again that, you know, it's not going to God work. does not let the the normal consequences of his the the laws of his kingdom work here. He just keeps he keeps coming in and st starting all over. How many times do you think Satan was just he, did, he thought he was just within a hair's breadth of winning, and then God does something that upsets the apple cart? Right. I mean, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, look at the time when <laughs> I, I'm agreeing with you. Yeah. Look at the and time the devil when people say, "Look here." You know, yeah. I'm right, and you keep butting in. Yeah. Well, let's talk about some of the things that God say do need to happen. Let's look at Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Right, let's start with 18. You know these verses very well. Jesus stood near, drew near and said to them, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Go, then, to all peoples everywhere and make, my, make them my disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you, and I will be with you always to the end of the world. So go, make disciples, baptize, teach. Are we doing those things? Well, it's interesting to look back well, to preacher. We didn't say pre only Gordon, preachers. Gordon isn't going around baptizing. And Why not? Matter of fact, he'd get in trouble if he did. Well, <laughs> if he was doing all the other things, maybe it would be all right for him to baptize. Well, maybe if, if, I might agree with that, but I'm not sure the church that works with the church manual. Well, look, look at look at Paul. Now, Paul's writing here near the end of his imprisonment to the Colossians. His imprisonment in Rome the first time. You must, of course, continue faithful on a firm and sure foundation and must not allow yourselves to be shaken from the hope you gained when you heard the gospel. It is of this gospel that I, Paul, became a servant, this gospel which has been preached to everybody in the world. Is that the truth? Been preached in pretty much all the world back then. I mean, that was in the days when you had to walk, or the best you could do was ride a horse. How can you get to the whole world in one generation? You, you got to admit, though, if you go anywhere in the United States, and I say, Ken, how much will you give me if I mention the word Jesus to that person over there, and he'll say, who is he? Yeah. How much will you give me for that? <laughs> I mean, right now, most everybody knows who Jesus is. Even the Muslim country. know who he is. In this country. In this country. Great, they right. might have a great misconception of who he is, but they know the name. Well, how can, try, try where do we get the misconceptions? I mean, where is that? Us. I mean. Which, which are the two most, po well, I should, the two most populous nations in the world? China and India. Try it there. Okay, but I bet you a dime you'll find some people that know about Jesus. Oh, you will find some, sure. Well, I know, but you'll go anywhere and you'll be surprised that, yeah. that they'll say, Jesus, yeah, we've heard of him. Yeah. Don't know too much about him, but we heard of him. Um, so, I mean, where is the point? Are you going to have everybody, when this is all done, are we going to have everybody be able to do a Bible study? Everybody in the world well, before this is done? That's what I'm asking you. What, what do we need? To, I'm, I'm not saying that's true. I'm just saying what the lesson here is about, okay, what do we need to do? For that, the latter rain to come. Yeah. This outpouring of... Yeah. Jesus, him, Jesus himself said to his first disciples there, just before he ascended to heaven, but when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, this is Acts 1, verse 8, 
You will be filled with power and you will be witnesses for me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So does that mean we just need to be on the internet and we'll take care of all that problem? Well, I mean, maybe that's one of the ways we'll do that at the end of time. I mean, it's certainly easier to communicate with the world today than it, than it was in Paul's day. But I, think if, I think you both put your finger on it. The basics haven't changed. If we are all able to preach a sermon, we might be getting somewhere a bit quicker than we have been. Yeah. Well, Matthew 24, 14 is another verse that's very familiar to us. And this good news about the kingdom will be, will be preached to all the world for a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. So does that mean we should say, okay, here's a list, we'll go to the United Nations, we'll get a list of all the nations, and we'll find out, okay, there's 10 that we aren't preaching in. And as soon as we finish preaching in those 10, we don't have to be any, just maybe just in the capital city, or maybe even in a rural area in those places. Man, job's done. Is this, I'll make it personal, is this my problem? To, to reach the whole world, or is it really what am, what's happening with, with myself? What, what am I, how am I relating to my relationship with God and, and reaching yeah. out, as opposed to worrying about the world, which I find to be overwhelming? Mm. And it doesn't say everybody, it just says it's going to go to all the nations. So all the nations already have this, but it's at least somebody at all. Revelation 18.1 says, the light of this angel, this is the fourth angel who's, who's adding his efforts to the three angels of Revelation 14, the light of this angel will enlighten the entire world. What, what does that mean? Well, what is the angel saying? Is he saying exactly what Paul was saying, or is he saying something new for this time? Here's, here's, what, here's what Ellen White expounds on that verse. I saw angels hurrying to and fro in heaven, descending to the earth and again ascending to heaven, preparing for the fulfillment of some important event. Then I saw another mighty angel, that's Revelation 18.1 says it, mighty angel, commissioned to descend to the earth to unite his voice with the third angel and give power and force to his message. Great power and glory were imparted to the angel as he descended. The earth was lightened with his glory. The light which attended this angel penetrated everywhere. Early Writings, page 277. The, the third angel, which is? Well, the three angels' message. Yeah, but the third angel, which is, um, what is it? Well, it's, it talks about the punishment that's going to fall on the people who, who accept the mark of the beast. Now, doesn't that sound like a different message than what Paul was doing? Paul was preaching Christ. Yeah. Now you got the third angel saying that the devil is going to lose it. I mean, we're going to take it away from him. Yeah. So, are we talking about the same thing here? Well, it's all part of the, I mean, Revelation, chapter 1, right up front says this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, we might not know how to put all that together, but God apparently knows how to put it together. Well, the work of the Holy Spirit, and of course, when we, we talk about the latter rain, we're talking about what? We usually meet, that usually is interpreted among Seventh-day Adventists at least as to being the, the time when the Holy Spirit will descend upon His people here on this earth and give them latter rain power, we call it, to, to spread the gospel. Did you just answer your own question here a moment ago about when this is going to come to be when you said we may not know how to do it, but God knows how to do it? Yeah. So is it something in order for the latter rain to come, is it something we have to do? Or is it uh, God doing something in his own time? He knows the time, and that's when he's going to do it. Well, there are lots of verses that, um, that we can look at that don't seem to say that. Let, 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 let's pick a couple of them. Uh, well, let's look at one particularly. Look at uh, Second Peter, if I can spell it correctly. Chapter 3, starting with verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come, that's what we're talking about, like a thief. On that day the heavens will disappear with a shrill noise, the heavenly bodies will burn up and be destroyed, and the earth will, with everything in it will vanish. So this is, not, uh, this is not something that happens every few days. 
or every few years. I mean, this is talking about the final events, right? Since all these things will be destroyed in, uh, in this way, what kind of people should you be? The, your lives should be holy and dedicated to God as you wait for the day of God and do your best to make it come soon. The day when the heavens will burn up and be destroyed and the heavenly bodies will be melted by the heat. What, what's going on here? Something pretty serious. <laughs> We're supposed to make it come soon, right? Well, it sounds like you make it come soon when you do those things. Um, how do you know that our making it is something that is in, on God's time turntable timetable too? And how many of us are going to have to do that? Is it 50% of the planetary population or 50% of the And remember when Christian Jesus was asked, population? when is the Lord going to come? <clears throat> no. What did he say? He said that only the Father knows. Mm -hmm. So Only the Father knows when we're going to get it all ready. <laughs> yeah, I guess, that, I guess you can look at it that way too. When we're going to... <laughs> Isn't this well, where the parable of the talents comes in somewhat? We're supposed to be using the talents we've been yeah. given. Well, in the history of the Christian church, the early reign refers to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, Acts 2. The latter reign will come in even greater power just before the second coming of Christ. It will put the final touch on God's work here on earth. We use the term early reign also to refer to God's Spirit convicting, instructing, guiding and empowering each believer in the normal growth of the Christian. The latter reign is spoken of in the life of an individual as a special endowment of God's Holy Spirit just before the second coming. Now so, the, we refer to the early reign as the day of Pentecost, mm -hmm. but it's not just limited to that 24-hour event when we're talking no. about the early reign. We're talking about that day and the whole ramification from that. The follow-up on it, yeah. Well, again, let me use some words from Ellen White. This is Acts of the Apostles 54 and 55. Under the figure of the early and the latter rain that falls in eastern lands at seed time and harvest, the Hebrew prophets foretold the bestowal of spiritual grace in extraordinary measure upon God's church. The outpouring of the Spirit in the days of the apostles was the beginning of the early or former rain Glorious was the result. And Jay, that's what you were just talking about. But near the close of Earth's harvest, a special bestowal of spiritual grace is promised to prepare the church for the coming of the Son of Man. This outpouring of the Spirit is likened to the falling of the latter rain. And it is for this added power that Christians are to send their petitions to the Lord of the harvest in the time of the latter rain. So, what does it mean sending our petitions? means to pray and I request it. I, I think it's interesting too that we skipped over one from Joel that he was pretty specific about it falls on everybody. Mm -hmm. And I think that are we, are we to be so um, naive to think it's only going to be directed to certain people or is it going to be coming on everyone and some are receptive and some are not? Okay, good question. Good, if I may. Uh, I believe it was paragraph three where you mentioned finally uh, uh, God established a Seventh-day Adventist church. But I, right now, I'm sure there are groups of Jehovah Witnesses, Mormons, who believe exactly as we believe, that they are the chosen group. And they go door to door and do this and do that. They probably believe they're like the Christ-like group. So I believe some people from every group, because we don't know. Mm -hmm. God will test the heart and... Well, and... and there's a very familiar quotation from L.O.I. It says that the greater number of God's true people are still in the other communions. That's right. Well, there's some very interesting... I mean, we, we talked about Second Peter 3, about how we're supposed to work to hasten on the second coming. Look at this very provocative statement from Ellen White, Review and Herald, March 22, 1892. Now, before I read the statement, let's talk for a moment. What was happening in 1892 in the Adventist Church? It was a few year, three or four years after 1888. Ellen White had been asked to go to Australia. She was out of the U.S. There was a 
tremendous movement in the U.S. government at that time to establish a national Sunday law. Right. A, some Adventists actually were, A.T. Jones was, was given the responsibility to speak in Congress on several occasions against the national Sunday law. Those are the kind of things that were happening. And Ellen White wrote back from Australia, you will not be able to say that he will come in one, two, or five years. Neither are you to put off his coming by stating that it may not be for 10 or 20 years. We are not to know the definite time either for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit or for the coming of Christ. Review and Herald, March 22, 1892. Does that mean that at any given moment, if the church really got its act together, Jesus would come somewhere between five and 20 years? That would be one within one generation, wouldn't it? Well, isn't she talking about the, when the holy, when the uh, latter rain comes? Yeah. Are you mixing those two together? Well, I'm. I'm. Saying, do you, don't you think when the latter rain comes, the end will follow pretty quickly? Yes. Whatever you mean by quickly, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, let's say let, let's leave it quickly. Okay. okay. So what preparation is needed for receiving the Holy Spirit's power in its fullness as a latter rain? Let's put our question in other terms. Look at some passages. Look at Acts 1, verse 14. They gathered frequently to pray as a group, together with the women, with Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Now, I, I, I look at this verse every time I read it, and I, I stand amazed. Because before the crucifixion weekend, what was the attitude of Jesus' brothers? Kind of against him. They were pretty much against him. They wanted. They thought it was their job to tell him what to do. They, they, he didn't seem to cooperate. They were punishing. What do you think happened over that week that impacted their lives? Resurrection. I think it was the resurrection. Well, the fact that he died has yeah. got to have some effect mm -hmm. in the way he died. You know, and the fact that he came out of the tomb. I mean, what would you think? I, I mean, I, I try to put myself, and I, I've suggested this, I try to put myself into this story. What would you think if you were one of the sons of really, you know, not real, they're not really blood brothers to Jesus, but they're, they grew up in the same household, the same family. What would you think if you were one of those brothers and sisters you had given him a bad time all the time, his whole life as a kid, and all of a sudden you realize that he's God. Would you be afraid to show your face? I think they probably had a similar reaction to the disciples. Mm -hmm. The light dawned. Mm -hmm. Well, they did have an advantage to actually live with him as they were beaten up on him. <laughs> and so they know that he never really held it against them. Yeah. And so, you know, when it finally clicked what, who he was, they may not have had a problem um, reaching out to him. Amazing. Now. Amazing. Well, um, so look. Ken, that mm -hmm. verse that you read, Acts 1.14, mm -hmm. is what the disciples and others were doing just before the day of Pentecost, the early yes. rain. Yes. So, yeah, that was your point. So, uh, something just occurred to me that I, in my younger years, I always got the impression that the statement, "the last movement sh shall be rapid ones," mm -hmm. is more on the world scene. But probably the latter rain is tied into it as well, from what you were just saying. Yeah. It yeah. goes two ways. Mm -hmm. What's What's the purpose of the latter rain? Maybe the latter rain is supposed to get us ready. Well, the Holy Spirit, let, let me just go through this very briefly. The Holy Spirit works at four levels in the lives of Christians. One, He keeps us alive. He literally gives us life. We could not take another breath without, the Holy, without God's power. Two, then He, he woos everybody. He tries to in, you know, influence us, to get us to think about Him, to think about God, and all that whole process to try to get us to come toward the direction we should be going. Three, if we start paying attention, we start reading and learning and so forth about him, then he convicts us, converts us, hopefully leads us to baptism. And then if we move on beyond that and we really develop a, an ongoing, growing relationship with him, 
then he gives us the gifts of the Spirit. And he, he, he gives us talents, if you want to call it talents or gifts. And basically those gifts are for the purpose of growing the church. They're supposed, God gives, us to each, gives them to each one of us as individuals, but we're supposed to be using those talents, using those gifts to help build the church. So those are the four levels. And I think what happens in the latter rain is he's going to have a whole group of people who are, who, are, who are at that point tuned up together, ready to receive the gifts of the Spirit and ready to use those gifts of the Spirit the way God wants them to. And God says, okay, now, whoosh, and the Holy Spirit will come forth with power. And You know, the Holy Spirit, uh, most Christians would say, is kind of a... Uh uh, a mysterious uh, entity in our lives. It's, mm -hmm. it's not as defined. We have the Old Testament. We have more of an exposure to, what, say, God the Father. And then we get in the New Testament, we see. <clears throat> is, this, is this latter rain, is that, going to be, is that going to be an experience where we finally, we finally actually really get a, a, a more intimate awareness and enlightenment of the Holy Spirit as we have seen with Jesus and is, 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 I, is that a, possibly a, a time when we become more intimately acquainted with hope. him where, where now it seems kind of a mystery that this Holy Hopefully, Spirit. hopefully is true. <laughs> However, I would like to make a slight correction to what you said. The God of the Old Testament is not the Father, it's Jesus. Well, I know that, but uh, yeah. nevertheless. <laughs> <laughs> Which is one and the same for me. But, yeah. But um, there's, there's another question I would like to ask. You know, we're discussing the la latter rain, like there's a big faucet in the sky, and God is there ready to turn it on. Mm -hmm. And when it turns on, it's the rain that comes down, and yeah. that's what we're looking for. What if there's a new truth that comes out that nobody really understands here now? Mm -hmm. And that truth uh, is, start, is preached and delights a lot of people and infuriates another person. Mm -hmm. What if it's something like that? What if it's a, it's, it's a piece of truth that we haven't put together about God yet? Mm -hmm. I mean, we're, we think that we know everything. I'm sure we do about God and all that's necessary about no, God. But let's, what let's, if... Let's not be ridiculous. What, <laughs> what if... What if there is some new revelation about God that even we well, can't even uh, put together right now? Or, or it's not necessarily a new revelation, a new truth. It's, it's, it's a focus. It's always or, been there, but That's right, very much like true. when Jesus came, um, he, he, he made us aware of things that we should have been, should have been aware all along, but... Is there, is there a, an example we could look to in the Bible that would show us what we should be doing? Well, Jesus came and showed us something new, basically, but yet, yet the truth has always been there. But there's, mean, there's an example I'm thinking of in the Bible that tells us exactly what we should be doing. To do what? What, what to, happened to, to, what? to get ready for the latter rain? Okay. What Just happened to get the disciples ready for the, for ready for the first rain? For the former rain. They came together, studied, and prayed. And they were and okay, okay, but what's going to do that? What if it is this thing that actually motivates even that? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's possible. I mean, look at the event that brought the disciples to, the, I mean, to this situation. They hear their, their leader. leader was taken away and Kill brought him. back. Mm -hmm. Yeah and then ascend it. And they suddenly realize that they've been dealing with God. And there's a big revelation. Yes. So I mean, so what if the latter raid has its own revelation? So what, what, how, many pe how many people were praying for that new? Well, the suggestion is there were around 120. So how many do we need these days? Yeah, so <laughs> yeah, why don't we just organize we and have a big... Are we you could in? Scrape, are you we in? Could, <laughs> we could scrape together 120 people. Yeah, we could, we could say, okay, who <laughs> will be in this building for two hours and pray constantly? Maybe that'll do it. 
They weren't there for two hours. They were there for days and weeks. Okay, days and weeks. How about four months? <laughs> I bet you we can find people that go up in an upper room somewhere, be on their knees. We can give them intravenous. Um, Don't need intravenous. You know. But I think you just said it. There are people that would do this. And to me, what I've been gleaning out of this whole thing is that the person is myself. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And until I'm willing to be that serious, I don't think anything is going to go on. And well, I'm not saying so. You got to be in it. Myself. Okay. Well, you have to be in it. For you, for yourself, have to decide if you are in it or not. Okay. Let, let me let me put it to you. Let, it, it's time for the rubber to meet the road. Okay. <laughs> okay. The, look at Acts th four, chapter four, starting with verse thirteen. The member and, and you remember this is after Peter and John have raised this guy. I mean, I've, I've repaired this guy, fixed this guy who was a cripple at the gate. He'd been there for a long time. Everybody knew him. He, he was right by the main gate entering to the temple. And Jesus, I mean, <laughs> Jesus, Peter and John come along and said, we don't have any money, but we'll give you what we have. Rise up and walk. And he did. And, of course, they were arrested for doing this. And the follow-up was what I want to talk about. The members of the council, and who are they talking about? Who are the members of the council? Pharisees and Sadducees. And the Sanhedrin. Sanhedrin. The, the, this, is, this is the government leaders, the church leaders, the government leaders, the big cheeses in those days. We're amazed to see how bold Peter and John were and to learn that they were ordinary men of no education. They realized then that they had been companions of Jesus. And if you look back up here, you know, look at what Jesus says. <laughs> I keep saying... Peter, full of the Holy Spirit, answered them, leaders of the people and elders, if we are being questioned today about the good deed done to the lame man and how he has healed, then you should all know. Okay, this, is, this is the ignorant fisherman, okay? You, all sh you should all know, and all the people of Israel should know, that this man stands here before you completely well through the power of the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified and whom God raised from death. Jesus is the one of whom the scripture says, and so forth and so forth. I mean, how many of us are prepared to stand up in front of Congress and make a speech like that? I know that's really wonderful. How many of you are willing to even witness to your neighbor? But look at what was behind how he, what he did that, I why think. he did that. Um, there's, there's a event that happened that he witnessed that he saw with his own eyes that that's was what he something says. that we could how could we duplicate that right now yeah. unless something's going to happen that will do that same thing and that's kind I, of what I'm wondering does that happen to me as yes. an individual that's that right what I have no problem with that I'm just I'm pointing to the thing you want it to happen to you right no I'm pointing to the <laughs> thing that motivated Peter to yeah. do that kind of thing I mean, look at, the, look at the drama that he had gone through. And look at this guy that he was with all this time, rose from the dead, and he finally got the light in his head that who he was. Mm -hmm. Okay, How, what is going to happen in the last days that are going to make people fired up like that? So you want some big events to happen to get us... To so, go uh, go together and all pray. All I'm saying and study is and that there ready. is something there, but there's something not here. There was something there, but there is something not why, here now. Why does it have to? I mean, the event is there. The event happened. You can read about it. You okay, discuss it. Why, why does, does it have to be now? Why Why doesn't it fire you up like it did to Peter? Well, well I, let me give the example of Paul. He's the he's he he wasn't there. In fact, he was, if anything, he was a part of the Sanhedrin. And yet he, be, he ends up being the biggest witness in the New Testament. And he says, Romans 1, 1, from Paul, a slave of Christ Jesus and an apostle chosen and called by God to preach his good news. What happened to Paul? Paul, of course, he was struck on the road to Damascus, but that wasn't what happened. What, I mean, that's what, that, that was, it, that's what it took to get his attention. But what really happened to Paul is Paul said, so help me. If that's the truth, I absolutely can't keep quiet about it. Paul even changed the way he said hello to people to try to spread the gospel. Well, what are we doing? Yeah, but you're not giving my point here. That, yeah, that okay, we are, we, what are we doing? 
But what have we had happen to us that makes us do what those guys were doing back then? I mean, what? I, I what are you it, looking oh, for? Do you have to? Do you have to pry it out yourself? Somehow? I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure everybody was doing that. Um, <clears throat> I don't know. There are other people there who were kind of support staff. There was Lydia and and all these other people. I'm not sure they were out. Uh, all these people, mm -hmm. I but think, I'm were sure filled were with the spirit things. and 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 were were part of this early reign. But I'm not sure they were all out uh, healing the sick and raising the dead and all of these kinds of things. Do we all have to be that way? No, but the twelve apparently did. Uh, and and I, I I don't know whether we need some bold leaders. Maybe we do. We need some of those. Uh, I think that I think that, I'm, and I'm partly with with Gary here. I think the time the time of crisis is going to come upon us, and and at some point the church is going to suddenly wake up. But I don't think God can allow the time of crisis to come upon us until. We have uh, the message so clearly in mind, because remember, when that time happens, we're going to face the devil who's going to raise our relatives and so forth from the dead, and they're going to stand in front of us, and, and I mean, not really, of course, they, they, they pretend, but they're going to stand in front of us and say, no, you're wrong, you know, you need to keep Sunday instead of Sabbath and things like that. Are we prepared to look the devil in the eye straight and say, you're wrong, the Bible says this and this and this, and you're trying to preach something different? What about, what about, um, we read recently, a few moments ago about Ellen White said there's lots of other people in other churches. Mm -hmm. How are they, how are they going to get this, this, mm -hmm. this fundamental knowledge that you're talking yeah, about think, here? Doesn't that also come into the realm of we're not going to be tempted? or confronted above what we are able, yeah. which I think what he brings up is reasonable, but I think you're making a mountain out of something that we each individual are going to have to face somewhere. Mm -hmm. And some people will go before Congress maybe for or the Supreme Court, and some of us will have to deal with something in the street, mm -hmm. in their own street. I think so that'll just happen. That will just I happen. I think maybe we'll realize when some of these things happen what's going on, and maybe it'll be later, like the disciples. I don't know, but I think there's an unknown here to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. I think we have some of the same issues that the disciples had. You know, God created us in, in his own image, but we, we return the favor many mm -hmm. times over. And hopefully with the latter uh, uh, reign, we will be able to open our, ourselves and not think we know everything and open ourselves to really absorb and accept God and really, really, I don't even know where I get, whew. it's true to really do it, not just fight over little things. And I think then if we're really able to do that and accept that everyone has a chance, you know, to be saved, I think things would change tremendously. So that possibly, Ken, there will be, I'll just throw out the term end time events here. Some of these end time events are actually going to be a crucible which will which will change change what change is a strong word strengthen us or refine us or mm -hmm. or um, and, and, and actually going to help us to prepare us to receive some of these. One of the now we know that the holy that some symbols are used in the Bible to describe the Holy Spirit. There's water. There's wind, there's oil, but there's also fire. Are you looking forward to being wrapped up in fire? <laughs> I mean, I don't know. It says we need to be baptized in fire. I mean, how much, what does it take to be baptized in fire? I mean, if the fire is the life giving power of God as described uh, in the Bible, then yes, absolutely. That's what we need. Well, maybe that'll take, that's what it'll take just to wake some of us up. So what you're saying, if I'm understanding you correctly, is the, God, the Bible implies very strongly that God is kind of like a consuming fire. Is that what you're saying? God is like a fire and when you're wrapped up into that fire, it's kind of like you are wrapped up 
in God. That, that's that's mm. God's glory. The God's the fire is God's glory. His his uh, his energy to us uh, is uh, salvation. Let's let's look at a couple of verses that describe that. Exodus twenty four, verses sixteen and seventeen is an excellent example. The dazzling light of the Lord's presence came down on the mountain. It's talking about Mount Sinai. To the Israelites, the light looked like a fire burning on top of the mountain. The cloud covered the mountain for six days, and on the seventh day, the Lord called to Moses from the cloud, and so forth. Um, Ezekiel saw what looked like a fire. And what do we do with Hebrews 12, 29? Because our God is indeed a destroying fire. Wow. Does it make you want to give him a hug? You have to put that in context of all the other, thi all the other verses that have well, God described as fire as you know, a there fire is, of, of glory. There is an aspect of fire back then that isn't so much now, and that fire was light. Mm -hmm. So um, you've got to kind of look at it in the light of light <laughs> mm -hmm. also. Yeah. Well, back in Isaiah 33, he said, the Lord says to the nations, now I will act, I will show how powerful I am. You make worthless plans and everything you do is useless. My spirit is like a fire that will destroy you. You will crumble like rocks, burnt to make lime like thorns burnt to, the, burnt to ashes. Let everyone near and far hear what I have done and acknowledge my power. And what's the response? The sinful people of Zion are trembling with fright. They say, God's judgment is like a fire that burns forever. Can any of us survive a fire like that? And then he says some amazing things. You can survive. Where are you going to survive? You're going to survive in the fire. You can survive if you say and do what is right. Don't use your power to cheat the poor. Don't accept bribes. Don't join with those who plan to commit murder or to do other evil things. Then you will be safe. Is he still talking about in the fire? You will be as secure as if you were in a strong fortress inside God's fire. You will be, have food to eat and water to drink. That didn't sound so bad. <laughs> By the way, you'll be interested to know a couple of weeks ago I was at Mount Sinai. And at St. Catherine's Monastery, at the bottom of Mount Sinai, there's a big, right inside the monastery, there's a big bush. And they said, this is the bush that was supposed to be on fire in Moses' day. So forth. It it was that near Midian? <laughs> when Moses. Well, Midian, that's, this was a part of what used to be Midian. But uh, Moses' father, is he hanging out that way down that far in the peninsula? Maybe. A, Maybe. Find it a, kind of a stretch. <laughs> <laughs> well. Help uh, the tourists. <laughs> it, 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 says, it says that Moses was herding sheep around Mount, Mount, Mount Sinai. A lot of, lot of uh, shrubbery around there for him to. <laughs> At least no, one, but, <laughs> but, <laughs> one <laughs> evidently. Maybe that's why. Maybe that's why they say this is the one. It's the only one around. <laughs> well, we've said that fire might refer to the glory of God. Habakkuk two fourteen is an interesting verse in light of that. Look at it that, but the glory, earth will be as full of the knowledge of the Lord's glory as the seas are full of water. So maybe the glory that we need is what? The knowledge of God. Is that possible? Maybe we don't know God well enough. I mean, God is the glory. Yeah, I think so. It might seem like Satan and sin are conquering our world. If you go out and walk, walk around, I mean, I just, I just heard a horrendous story this morning at the clinic. Had a lady come in whose grandson was trying to break up a fight, and it turns out it was teenagers and fighting over some guy that didn't pay his debt for, for getting some marijuana. And this one guy took out a big old li knife. Instead of stabbing the, the, the guy, he said, I'm going to kill you. He told the other kid, I'm going to kill you. He took out this big old knife, and the grandson of, this, of my patient was in the way, and he got he got his liver sl poked, sl slashed, and his gallbladder wiped out, and his intestines cut up. And fortunately, he's he's recovered. He got straight to surgery and so forth like this. But man, alive, you know, it seems like sin is just permeating everything. All the time. 
But it's interesting that the book of Revelation tells us it's not sin that wins, it's God that wins. How is that going to happen? What's gonna, what is necessary to turn it all around? The latter rain. There you go. And how's that going to happen? It's interesting to notice that in Ezekiel 28, 19 and, uh, 18 and 19, especially if you take one of the more traditional, more literal translations, it says, I'm sorry here, I need to uh, get to the right place for just a second, give me a moment. Let's try that again, okay. Now, it should take us where we want to go. By the multitude, now this is a, you remember that Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28 talk about Lucifer's behavior up in heaven and what's going to happen to him. Here's the end of that discussion in Ezekiel 28. By the multitude of your iniquities and the unrighteousness of your trade, you profaned your sanctuaries. Therefore, I have brought fire from the midst of you. It has consumed you, and I have turned you to ashes on the earth in the eyes of all who see you. What's going to be the final end of Satan? Ashes. Ashes. He's going to, fire is going to come forth with, from within him and consume him. Well, how will we be involved in all this? In this latter rain stuff? What are we supposed to be doing? Servants of God, this is Great Controversy, page 612. Servants of God, with their faces lighted up and shining with holy consecration, will hasten from place to place to proclaim the message from heaven by thousands of voices. How many? Thousands of voices. All over the earth, the warning will be given. Miracles will be wrought. The sick will be healed, and signs and wonders will follow the believers. Well, is there anything else that could possibly rival that in importance? Isn't it clear that God is ready? But he's chosen to work through us. So he chooses not to do anything until we are ready. The message will be carried, and again, these are Ellen White's words, the message will be carried not so much by argument as by the deep conviction of the Spirit of God. The arguments have been presented, the seed has been sown, and now it will spring up and bear fruit. The publications distributed by the missionary workers have exerted their influence Yet many whose minds were impressed have been prevented from fully comprehending the truth or from yielding obedience. Now the rays of light penetrate everywhere. The truth is seen in its clearness, and the honest children of God sever the bands which have held them. Finally, connections, I'm sorry, family connections, church relations are powerless to stay them now. Truth is more precious than all besides. Notwithstanding the agencies combined against the truth, a large number take their side, take their stand upon the Lord's side. Ellen White, Great Controversy, page 612. And that truth being? The truth about God. The, the picture of God in the, all 66 books of the, old, of, the, of the Bible. There are mechanisms in place by which the whole world could know in a very short time, in a matter of hours, if not minutes, all about God. Well, no, don't say that. A lot no. about God. They could know about God. Okay. They could know, as no. as she says, the you know to influence them to make a decision, to open up their minds, and it could happen very quickly. What do you suppose she had in mind when she said, not so much by argument as by the deep conviction of the Spirit of God? I wonder if it gets back to like you, when <clears throat> Peter was in front of the, the church leaders mm -hmm. and you said it didn't look like they were convinced at the time, but they came around. And I think that they didn't come around by argument. Mm -hmm. They came around because they maybe allowed themselves to be influenced by the Spirit. And Peter said, just in so many words, he says, we can't keep quiet about what we've seen and heard. I mean, if we have the deep conviction of the Spirit of God, will we be able to keep quiet? 
I believe that Seventh-day Adventists have the most logical and coherent message in the field of religion and theology that has ever been known. We have a massive amount of information that we can study and digest. We have so many promises that God, from God that we cannot even quote them all. What are we waiting for? The Jews had pretty much all those same... We have all the writings of Ellen White. We have way more information that they have than they had. We have the New Testament. We have, we have, we have clarification of several things, but yes. they had pretty much all the same stuff. Yeah. It's very interesting that Dr. Stephen Hawking, one of the world's greatest scientists, called the concept of an afterlife a, quote, fairy, fairy story for people afraid of the dark, end quote. Why does a statement like that show just how crucial and hopeful our message is for a world that knows neither God nor his love? A fairy story for people afraid of the dark. The reason I'm here is because someone described it as practical Christianity. Mm -hmm. and I think you take the concept Sabbath was one that was very, very important to me. And the, uh, <clears throat> just as an example, making that a practical thing as opposed to a ethereal theological discussion. Mm -hmm. And I believe that's really what it's all about. Yeah. Making a difference in people's lives. And we talked earlier about, you know, the love of Jesus. And if we really loved each other, the whole world would notice. Matthew 5, 16, one of the verses I quote really often, says, if we witness the way we should be, the world will notice and they will give glory to whom? The Father, God. Do we really want Jesus to come back? <clears throat> you know, if you, if you take a survey of church members, not just within the Adventist church, but Christians in general, you'll discover that they, they all hope that Jesus will come back about five years after they die. <laughs> That's the sort of average. Okay. Let me live my life, and then, yeah, okay, God, you can come back and take me. But we're, we're kind of spoiled. We have a pretty good life. Mm -hmm. What if you weren't as fortunate and were yeah. living a terrible life? Would your oh. zeal be a little different? I found that to be, an, or I think that's an impediment to people looking at their options in life. If they're happy and, and content where they're at, why would you want to change? Life's good. I was wondering about the, the statement about being scared of the dark. Yeah. How does making up something help people from being scared of the dark? He's referring Isn't to it? death. Yeah, I know that. But um, doesn't don't people not get scared of the dark when they reach in and they can feel something and know what it is? I mean, if it's something that you just make up, how does that help you not be scared of the dark? Mm -hmm. I mean, to me, People are not scared of the dark because they they know that there's something there, and um, you can't fix that with kind of a fantasy. Mm -hmm. So it, it could be that people who uh, hadn't thought about this before, people who uh, make up the excuse that there's no afterlife, maybe they're maybe what they're afraid of is consequences. Is life, mm -hmm. <laughs> life after death. Well. We know a couple things. Well, and let me just ask one more question before I talk about this. Do we have questions about, about Jesus' promises? Maybe we don't believe his promises. Uh, which promises? Well, all the ones we've been talking about here, particularly about his second coming. And the latter rain and mm -hmm, all that. But and don't we believe those things? Okay. It depends on the promises. Let's say uh, one part Jesus said, where I go, you will come to, uh, and a lot of people think they're going to get this mention, mm -hmm. uh, but Jesus never promised anybody a mention. No. Is, isn't my life promise-filled enough? I don't know. If, if it is, would we, be, would we be receiving the latter rain? Is my problem, my life is promise-filled enough, but there are people around me who, who, whose life isn't promise filled and I'm jaded to that or I'm not attuned to that. I, I don't see I mean, how, how long does God need to wait? 
And, you know, it, we're almost at the end of our class, but I'm going to leave you with something to really to think about. Ellen White says in Volume 1 of Selected Messages, page 233 to 235, that at the 1888 General Conference in Minneapolis, the General Conference leadership turned back the latter rain. What does that tell us? And how did they do it? Well, by not accepting the message that was presented to them at that Which time. Which was what message? Well, it was the <laughs> message given by A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner about righteousness by faith. And it's very interesting that Ellen White immediately, I mean, almost, if you read the historically what happened to her, she launched from that point, that very year she printed Great Controversy. She started off working at that point on. Patriarchs and Prophets came a couple years later, and then Desire of Ages. And she, she saw, in page 345 there, it gives the message, she saw that we are not to picture God as waiting to punish the sinner for his sin. She, she saw a new picture of God. Talking about something new that we need. She saw a new picture of God as a result of that conference that came out of that conference. And she started preaching it, and, and her, her message changed from that time on. Back to Gary's question earlier, what, what event is yeah. going to happen? I think the picture of God is the one thing that we have been fortunate to have and one thing we can help the rest of the world find. We need to, we need to tell the world that Satan has been out there trying to misrepresent God and the time has come for us to do our homework, to do our studying, to recognize what was going and say, this is the truth about God. This is the kind of God you can trust. And most importantly, this is the kind of God that we have so firmly in mind, so clearly in mind, that when the devil sends the worst of his forces against us, we will say, no, God is not like that. He's like this. And if God had a group of people who are ready to do that, I believe the second coming would be right around the corner. A group of people who really understood, really have gone through their Bible and said, what does every story, every passage in the Bible say to us about God? And get that combined picture and get it clearly in mind so that not the devil himself would be able to confuse us. Then that's what would happen, I believe. We hope you've enjoyed our discussions and we would encourage you to have a look again at our website, that's theox.org. See you next week.